All right. Good morning, everybody. We are going to go ahead and get started here. Um, I am dropping the links in for the sign-in and the slides. One thing I do want to let you know, the copy of the slides you have is actually not a copy of the complete set of slides that you'll see on screen today. Um, you will get this set of slides uh, later on. Um, uh, we may send those out today. We will certainly send them out with the link to the video at the start of the week next week. And so rest assured that you will have that uh, coming up. We will be using breakout rooms for a portion of our time this morning. We've got some, some really exciting updates that we're going to share to kick things off. Um, I am going to um, kind of get things going here. We have a very small agenda today. We're going to mostly focus on team-based challenges. We'll explain why. Again, everything we're going to do for the bulk of the meeting today, well, really the entire meeting, comes directly from uh, what the agency team, led by Heather Lucan on the topic of the Career Pathway Endorsements, has learned from the applications that have come in. And so this is, is directly in line to help us with that. And really, at this point in the year, obviously, we know how busy it is for everybody. We were talking about graduations uh, earlier this morning. And we uh, were really obviously in the mode in terms of professional learning for applying what we've learned to next school year and beyond. And so that will, will be the focus here as we move through this. So first of all, we do have some quick announcements. Heather, I'm going to turn it over to you to share this data. Good morning, everyone. Um, as it stands with the uh, applications that, that have come in through, through this year, we are now with a, a total of 190 school districts that have access to the PWR platform. Um, that does not mean that all 190, as you can see from the second <laughs> statement there, um, are, are planning to issue those endorsements for FY23. I have quite a few that are planning for 24 and beyond. Um, but they wanted access to that platform now so they could get the ball rolling with that. So 63 districts have approved FY23 plans. We're at 161 approved plans and all seven career pathways have approved plans. So that's very, very exciting news. And for those of you that fall in this category, those uh, the information regarding your students that have received the endorsement, they will um, be, that document will be probably sent out within the next two weeks so that you'll have that. You can start entering that information. Um, well, I click over to the graph. Heather, we do have a question in the chat. Do you see any more being approved this year? Or is this pretty much final? That's pretty final, I would say. Great. Maybe maybe a handful, if that, for, for that. I'm waiting to hear back on a few. And here you see the breakout by uh, Career Pathway. And I apologize that we use the abbreviations. Uh, if you have questions about that, we can certainly update that. Yeah. Big increase, as you can see there, with uh, with METS and also um, more with IT this year. So it was nice to see that. I, of course, am a huge advocate for arts and communications. So <laughs> I was very happy to see that as well. Yep. So everybody's on the big board now. So again, super exciting. Um, thank you all for all of your hard work. And I want to add one little story that we didn't have in the plans here. I was on LinkedIn uh, two days ago, and I actually don't think I finished writing the comment. And I, I do see the person that posted this and who the comment was directed to. Um, and so I will go back. I won't disclose more about this. But a student had um, posted a certificate they'd gotten in the district with that represented their career college and career pathway endorsement and it had the the logo on it and the student was how cool first of all let's just stop there the student was sharing their endorsement on linkedin that's pretty cool second of all a district level staff member in a not small school district was seeing this and was so excited to amplify the student congratulate the student respond to the student and just the whole thing, I think I think it was really exciting. I think for those of you who've worked in this space for years, I, I think this is another step. And so again, congratulations to everybody who is, is making this happen locally and giving students and, and teachers uh, these opportunities. It is um, super cool. So with that said, um, got a couple other updates. Heather, do you wanna jump in on this one real quickly? Sure. 
Um, we are in the final stages of getting the IWAS application up and running. So we hope to move into testing mode very soon, which means that I can put some fake data in there and make sure that it, it functions correctly. Um, so that, that's exciting um, to get that in. We've Each time we start to update, I say, oh, we need to add a few more things here to make this a little easier for everyone. So that's kind of where the where the status is with that. Um, and yes, we're still recommending to wait to complete the application until August. I've, I've received quite a few emails, especially from those who just recently turned in their applications. Um, and a lot of them are, are using the, the guidebook as, as a, a way to make a document to, to kind of house all of the information. And others are like, no, I'm just gonna jump right in and start to use the platform so it's stored there. Either way works. Um, just you would just need to make sure, as I said, there's probably going to be some copy paste um, for you to do if you currently have plans in there, um, and and then we'll just proceed. But it is it is moving forward for that. Awesome. Last big announcement. No timeline here, but um, it's getting close. Heather, you want to make sure everybody understands sure. the process. Sure. Yep, the, those draft rules are being finalized. They were sent out to a couple of entities that need to take a look at those, and then we will present those to the ISBE board. Um, we're not sure what date, which board meeting that will happen. Then they will be posted for the, the public comment and then reconsidered internally, as Jason has got there, uh, for based on that public comment, and then they'll go back to the board for official approval. And I, I do not have a timeline on that because a lot of it just has to do with when we can get that in front of the board and anything we need to change over the next few weeks. So we will specifically keep the Career Pathway user group informed as this process commences. Uh, once a board meeting has been selected for the draft rules to be initially presented at, you, you will get a message through the Career Pathway user group. So uh, rest assured, again, you'll have you'll have the inside scoop on that information and and we'll we'll walk you through the process as that takes place. It is even possible that we would host a uh, kind of impromptu summer meeting to kind of revisit yeah. this process for those who are interested inside the user group. And that, of course, would be open to anybody as these are. Um, but but you would you would be the ones we'd be directing that to. A uh, quick uh, announcement. Again, we are at this point shifting now to the summer professional learning calendar. You've got the links in here. Um, office hours continues. Um, so that's going on. And we want to specifically call out, uh, we are very, very excited on the NIU Illinois CTE project team uh, for our tour of the state. We are going to be all over the state this summer in person. We are doing these morning team-based challenge workshops in all of these settings. The goal is to have uh, groups of teachers come and we wanna fill these spaces. And then at many, but not all of these because of, of kind of the travel arrangements and some of, the, uh, some of the other things we have to attend to. But at many of these, there will also be a, a separate afternoon workshop that's shorter, like an hour and a half workshop, which is really an in-person version of some of the other workshops we've done. So a number of the equity focused workshops will take place on these afternoons. You can see all of those in our summer calendar. The link is in the register button. Again, I do wanna call out, we are finalizing the location still on the June 14th and August 3rd um, uh, sessions, but we will, we will obviously update you on those as we have them. And so we hope to see not only a number of you, but but lots and lots of teachers from, from your school districts in person this summer. Um, we're super excited about that. And, and Jill, to your question, yes, we will send communication throughout that process. And, and that's part of what we would discuss even in a meeting is talk about what kinds of things can make good public comment. Because um, if there's things you like in the rules, those are things that are important to comment on so they, they don't get left out in a final version, for example. Whereas normally we think of commenting on, on rules to say like, this is a problem, this needs to be fixed. And that's certainly part of what should be commented on as well. Um, just second slide, this is the more specific locations for those. So you've got that information here. If, if you're curious and interested in trying to make travel plans, especially uh, for an administrator who's gonna be supporting teachers. Uh, we've got some resources slides in here. We're not gonna spend time talking about these. These are all things you've seen before, but we want, oh, I really didn't want to click on that. Sorry about that. But we did want to make sure that you continue to have access to these close at hand. And we wanted to remind all of you, 
please don't be shy about emailing out things to the user group. Um, if you've got student celebrations, um, I would ask you to share some photos with the user group. Let's start. Um, it is not bragging in this case. This is a community of people working together. And the last thing is, uh, there was it was listed in this past week's um, state superintendent weekly newsletter from ISBE that there would be a June meeting. There won't be a June meeting. We've talked to lots of people. That's the first Friday that a number of school districts are, are closed for the summer. There are other school districts that are still in session. And obviously that is uh, like the last day of school or the last Friday before the last few days of school the following week. And so it's just not a good day for people. So again, we hope to see you in person at workshops this summer. And again, we anticipate you will certainly be getting emails about things throughout the summer and we may throw together uh, some impromptu meetings. So the next scheduled meeting though will be in August. Heather? Sure, before we dive into um, having those conversations regarding the team-based challenges, I just wanted to put this uh, in here as a reminder for the vision of the pathway endorsements uh, is of quality for those students and the experiences that they have um, as they go through the college and career pathway endorsement process. And in achieving that goal, we are focusing on the quality, the relevance, and the authenticity of instruction for all of our students and also to increase those opportunities to become proficient with the essential skills. All righty. Um, so we are gonna primarily focus on team-based challenges because the ISB team has identified this as, Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, the number one area in which there's been feedback provided to districts and um, kind of core then to the experience and. And I think it actually makes a lot of sense. I was thinking about this late last night. I haven't shared this with either Heather or, or our team at NIU, but my thought was this kind of makes sense because this is the place where the course sequence and then um, the work-based learning experiences come together, right? It's that transition point. And so that, there's a lot going on there to try and, and figure out. And so um, the other thing, we're going to look at some examples. And what I want to share is, these examples are good. They're all good. And um, I cannot tell you, if I had a dollar for every time Heather said, I think these things are really going on, or I think mm -hmm. it just needs this tweak. This sounds like really exciting instruction. I just want to support everybody in the process. We would all be together right now having a very fancy brunch. And there's a hundred of us having this meeting because Heather does say those things all the time. And so um, I think that's really important to bear in mind. And again, we want to approach this next phase. Um, we've been doing this, this user group all year. We, we did it for the full year a couple of years ago, and we're going to keep going. And so we really want to be a community of learners who can support each other kind of as critical friends. And so that's the approach we're going to take here. So a couple of things, a couple of reminders. These are kind of big ideas that the team-based challenges should include. They should be authentic learning experiences with an ex expert mentor who's someone other than their regular classroom teacher, um, who's again an expert, um, provide <laughs> students the opportunity to experience elements of the career and apply some of the competencies that they're learning about. And then they should get a chance to demonstrate proficiency on one or two technical competencies and one or two of the essential skills. Now, are there exceptions to that? There could be, like we've talked about, there is a team-based challenge that a few schools uh, could use working very closely with um, a major defense contractor. That team-based challenge actually lasts just over three months. And would it be appropriate in that one to have three or four technical competencies being covered? Probably, there's literally engineers from that company in those classrooms every week. Like that could make total sense, but typically, um, for team-based challenges that are anywhere from a, a special day to a week, uh, seven, eight day learning unit in a classroom, you're going to want to be real tight. And we're going to talk about that today. This is the checklist of what it should include. This aligns with um, where, where the draft rules were developing, and we've talked about that. And then again, another advertisement here. Yes, we're going to continue to advertise these. <laughs> Please come see us this summer, uh, whether whether in Vienna, Dixon, Palatine, or somewhere else. 
um, please come see us this summer. And uh, the goal of these workshops is to have teachers walk out with, with kind of one team-based challenge done and dusted. What we probably will not really get to in a three-hour team-based challenge, even with really awesome, especially CTE teachers walking in who are already doing things in their classrooms that have most of the elements of a team-based challenge, we probably really won't get to the assessment piece in, in great detail. That's like the next step after that. And so we're already talking about um, additional things we might add to the 23-24 professional learning calendar that is already posted um, for next year, additional things we can add to support work around really high quality assessments in CT classrooms broadly, as well as in team-based challenges, because that is like a perfect overlap between those two things. Um, it's watching and observing and listening to what kids are doing and saying, and then giving them direct feedback on that. So Heather, we're gonna turn it over to you here to talk about some of these consistent issues that the team at ISB has seen as applications have come in. Right, and, and for those of you that have submitted plans or emailed me uh, examples of routine-based challenges, some of these, I'm sure you've seen my comments that have been on these. And so that is the question that that Jason and his team asked me as far as what I'm seeing when I'm doing the reviews and what I think we could as a group um, need more support on. Um, and just as Jason said, I always start and I, I hope that I get that message across to all of you as well, that I know these things are happening and I know that they're very solid and they're very strong and I know that we're working on them. Um, we just need to make sure that they are meeting that quality component and, and rephrasing some of the terminology that we're using in there and narrowing down some of the, the, the scope of, of these. So um, what I see when I'm doing the reviews, a, a lot of times is whether or not, and I'll, I'll put this in the comments, is this a whole class assignment or an individual assignment or is it a true team-based challenge? So keep in mind that they should be group projects and completed by that group. Oftentimes it's a it's an end of the year type lesson that they're completing and that doesn't really fall into the realm of the team-based challenge because of number two. Uh, and this is a big one too, I've, I've put this on there as well. What is that authentic problem? What is the problem that they're trying to solve? Oftentimes it's phrased as just, well, the students will work in teams to do this but not really identifying why. Why is it that you've chosen that? And I can see it when I'm reading through it. It just needs to be more clear so that the students understand that as well, that they are working towards um, determining some type of, um, you know, their answer basically to the response of that or what it is that they need to work on to answer that, that problem or question that's been posed to them. And then also um, there's often been a lack of identification of the, the problem or even the partner. So if it's something that's ongoing and it could be a multiple multiple um, examples of that authentic problem, for example, and sometimes I'll see, well, it varies from year to year. The employers vary from year to year. I We need to see evidence of who those, of what those problems are. So give examples. So it's fine that it's gonna last, you know, that you're gonna change it up every year, so to speak, but provide those examples for that as well as with the employers. Um, that would allow us to be able to verify those if needed. So it's, it's important to have, that, um, to have that information in your description. And then when we look at other um, concerns that we have with the, the team-based challenges, um, oftentimes we're seeing the, the competition and while that's not a bad situation for the students to be in, I, I strongly encourage those because the technical competencies that those students cover, yeah, probably more so. I mean, it, but again, it kind of lends itself to an end of the year type situation for them where they're mastering those technical competencies. I often see a lack of those essential skills that are, are needed to qualify for a team-based challenge. And oftentimes it's not a team activity. It's one individual demonstrating their mastery of those technical competencies. And uh, another concern is that that competition may not offer well-defined feedback. Uh, so it may just be, yes, you get to move on. No, you do not. Um, and as we're looking at those competitions, rather than providing them that feedback, which allows them to 
take it to the next step, so to speak, and, and revamp what they've come up with in response to that authentic problem, which is another, um, another way to say, how do you identify what that authentic problem is within those competitions? Sometimes those are defined by the competition itself, but they're not really communicated with in the description of that team-based challenge. Um, also, the too many essential skills and technical competencies, oftentimes they'll have them all listed as this is what it, it's, it's mastering and this, it really needs to be focused on a specific set of those skills. It's very difficult for a, a teacher to assess all of the skills. Again, that lends itself to that end of the year kind of project or end of the year um, event that they're doing that, that really should be broken down to find specific skills that they could uh, master as they're doing the team-based challenge. And then the team activities where the students are completing or compete individual and different tasks. So there has to be some type of integration of that collaboration with the students in the development of the product. So having uh, different teams of students working on different items does not really um, allow them to come back with that feedback and say, this is what my team came up with for this, and so therefore we can have those conversations to see um, what's going to work, what needs to be changed. But those were the biggest um, things that I saw as we're going through, and oftentimes that feedback to you was along those lines where it's like, make this a little more specific or expand on your authentic problem. Let me know what those technical competencies are. I tried to be very specific with have it being one or a max of two for those um, essential skills and technical competencies. But as Jason said, there are some situations where you may have more than that. So it really lends itself back to always focusing on that authentic problem and what it is the students are trying to solve. That then filters down all of your competencies as well as the assessment and the mentor as well. So before I go on, uh, Terry put a great question in the chat. And Terry, what I'm going to ask us to do, and I, I know you will hold me accountable to what I'm about to say, and I'll try and hold myself accountable to this. Terry's question first was, what would you suggest for certain career areas that do not always work on teams? Let's put a pin in that. And the reason I'm saying that is because I think that's a really important thing that we can, we can come back and explore and talk about. And so if other people have ideas about that, please keep that in mind. I am wanting to make sure we get through what we are going to do time-wise today. And again, we're going to keep working on that. And Terry, I'm going to make sure that, that we talk about that, you and I, at some point then in the next week, um, so that that can be considered also in advance of um, uh, this summer's team-based challenge uh, workshops that we'll be doing. So that's a, a great question. So with this said, we're going to dive into some, some team-based challenges here. And in your slide deck, you will see, well, before we do this, um, again, these team-based challenges are, it's, this is not to say these are like failed team-based challenges, far from it. Um, they have a ton of strengths. And so again, we wanna engage in this work in, in making them truly exemplary is kind of the goal today. And so what you've got is you've got examples like this. Uh, there are four examples in here. And then for each example, there are, for three of them, there's one question. For the last one, there's actually two questions. And so the questions come right after them and they look like this. And what we want you to do is not only answer that question, but see if that, if that answer is like, oh, that's okay. But the next question that's not listed in the slides is, and how can you make it better? And so what we're gonna ask you to do is to take the next, uh, we're gonna go with about, well, 15 minutes, we'll come back together at 9.40. Um, and we're gonna have you try and, someone be a timekeeper in the breakout room uh, to keep things moving along. Um, I'd encourage at least one group to be brave enough to start with uh, number three or four. Uh, number four is the one with two questions. And so we can, we can cover all those and then we'll come back together and we'll talk about what we saw, um, which, which may not be the only right answers to this either. We will be both the NIU team members and Heather will be bopping in and out of, of breakout rooms when we bop in. Uh, please don't stop your conversation, just keep going. Uh, we're there to listen and, and we'll be taking notes on what we're hearing to again, make sure that we're coming back and challenging ourselves and each other to sharpen our tools on A, what supports we're providing and B, also like what when we come up with our own examples, what, what those are and what we would wanna do in, in different classrooms. 
So we're going to dive into those breakout rooms now. Uh, they'll be totally random here. And then we'll come back in 15 minutes and um, look at look at where you were and where we were. Thanks. As we dive into these, we're going to show you some of the things that we pulled out in advance. One thing I do want to call out in the opening line of number one here that's that's done well, and this was something that Heather was asking for feedback on, so Heather, you're welcome to jump in on it before we move on, is that it did include this, this specificity, excuse me, of that students are broken up into teams of two to four students. And so, Heather, I don't know if you want to comment on, on that and what you were looking for related to that, and if not, we can just pop on. I, I think that um, when the authentic problem or even the final product was unclear, really hitting home the fact that these are teams that are working towards this, this solution um, needs to be in the description of this to help clarify that. And we recognize too, and I've had conversations with some of our smaller schools where that, that class may only have five students. They may only have six students. Um, with the intent, obviously, that we're hoping that that would grow, um, but it still needs to reflect how uh, teams of students can work together. So that is why I've, I've often put it, is this truly a team-based challenge? Sometimes it reads as if, as if it's just the class itself that is working towards this, rather than knowing that they are broken up into, into groups of students. Okay. Hey, um... One other thing I want to mention before we move on, one thing that you will not see covered in any of these follow-ups is any mention of who the mentor is. And that came up in one of the breakout rooms I was in. And so I think we could probably take these same examples and come back and analyze the, the role of the mentor and have that be a whole nother discussion. We're not going to do that today, but I appreciate the, the individuals who, who brought up that question. Um, and so who the mentor is and what they're doing, and when they're doing it, how they're doing it. Um, and so first of all, what is the authentic problem with example one? Well, first thing that, that everybody on our end did is we, we chunked kind of the answer and we found what we thought the teachers thought was the authentic problem um, here in, in this middle chunk. Um, and this one of the things that we talked about, and I'm going to ask Heather to talk a little bit more about this, she did earlier today already, but is this is definitely an authentic task, um, but the difference between this concept of the authentic problem and the authentic task, and, and we've got some other examples of that here today. Heather, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, we just I just had this conversation with the group that I had jumped into. Um, this is how this is. I see this as, as, a, as a lesson plan. Like this is what the students are going to be doing today for this or, or for this. Um, but when we talk about an authentic problem, I would like to look at it as how are you going to pose this to the students to get them engaged? What is the language you're going to use with them? The question you're going to pose to them, the rationale for why you're asking this question of them so for them to be able to solve it. And I think if you look at it that way and you think about how you can rewrite this, um, as, as a way to engage the students, whether it's the teacher that is actually um, presenting this to them and, and then having the follow up with the mentors or if it's the mentor themselves, how would they pose it to the students to get them engaged and to get them into the process of solving that authentic problem? So we, one of the things that we did is, is we rewrote the problem um, to make it an authentic problem. And Again, this would be, and, and you might say, well, you're not gonna be able to partner with the FBI. Well, the truth is you might be able to partner with the FBI. I was at a, a career day in a school last year where there were four, uh, in, in Illinois, there were four uh, FBI, uh, members of the FBI who were, who were there working with students on that day. Uh, you might be able to work with the local police department or the county police department. And so um, anyways, with that, uh, your team is assisting the FBI with an operation to hide specific information inside an image for an undercover agent using 2D arrays and techniques of steganography. Use the picture lab exercises to accomplish this mission. So, and again, this, there's a lot tied into this, who the mentor is. This problem does not on its own spell out uh, what essential skills or technical competencies are being covered. Um, but in terms of the core of the problem statement, this takes it from the task to the problem and, and even here, I think this is almost written um, 
maybe even more directly than I would want to be with the you um, use the picture lab exercises to accomplish this mission. I, I'm I'm not sure I'd even want that sentence in there in a in a team based challenge. This is again supposed to be kind of that dress rehearsal before students go into a workplace and do these kinds of things alongside professionals, and certainly not at the level of professionals. They're they're high school students getting these experiences initially, but we want them to problem solve and say, what, what should I be doing here? What, how do we approach this? What's our strategy? Um, that's a really important part of this process. So we're gonna move on to example two, unless Heather, you have anything else on example one? Nope, I think that covers it. Great, so example two, um, I've got this, um, Student teams will work collaborat collaboratively. I'm in the middle of the, the paragraph here to design a more efficient emergency medicine delivery system. Um, we've got some technical, a technical competency, excuse me, that's been identified and two essential skills that have been identified. And our question here is what is the authentic problem? So when we looked at this, um, we again uh, broke this out into a couple chunks to really pull this apart. And that was how, how we had done that. And then we, we rewrote the, the problem statement um, in, and really, again, defined it as a problem. And I apologize, I think we might have two different color fonts there. Um, emergency rooms, when built quickly, have numerous inefficiencies. Your team task is to analyze these inefficiencies in a local hospital and develop a new design. Uh, your knowledge of, um, use your knowledge of emergency medical careers, diagnostic testing, patient evaluation, human body systems, and medical interventions to analyze the workings of a local emergency room and then provide a new drawing. Um, and so at the end, again, this is, is not about, they're, they're not studying to become architects, these students, um, but we know, and certainly those of you who've had exciting school construction projects recently have hopefully worked with architects who really leaned heavily on educators and hopefully students to help uh, influence the designs locally of, of those solutions. So uh, this was the rewritten problem statement here to again, take it from do this task to here's the problem. How do you, how do you attack the problem? Um, how do you strategize in a team at that problem? Heather, comments from you. Nope, we covered that, that's good. So um, the problem statement, you know, some, some follow-up event or ideas that could apply to other, um, other career pathways. Um, so these are other examples that kind of suffered from the same thing, develop a business plan, weld a bike, build a robot. These are all examples of truly authentic tasks. But in all three cases, you can see we, we kind of reacted to, okay, what is the problem that the plan is intended to solve? So we want to present the problem and then have students maybe first step in solving that problem be to understand, oh, well, we need to develop a, a business plan. We need to weld, know how to weld because we're going we're gonna to build bikes to solve this problem or we're going to build a robot to solve this problem. And so backing it up, one, one really important step from the authentic task itself is what can allow students to really uh, approach the authentic problems. And we just had a really interesting conversation in one of the breakout rooms about this concept on example four, and we'll, we'll come back and talk about that. But, you know, if uh, it, that strategy is what's going to separate our students from maybe what the machines can do on their own, right? So, um, most people that go out and buy a bike in the next few weeks to start riding a bike this summer are not buying a bike that was designed and welded um, by hand by an individual artisan or a team of artisans. Um, and so even, even those of us who, who ride bikes like crazy, the truth is most of our bikes today are being built by machines. And so if we're just telling the AI, hey, design me a better gravel bike or a better road racing bike with lot, for lots of mountains or a better road racing bike for central Illinois where it's flat and windy. Um, the AI can take other designs and do that at this point. So if we want our students to have a space in the future, it's these kind of strategies to attack problems and understand what those next authentic tasks are, that's gonna be what really separates them. 
Heather, comments about that? Uh, you summed that up nicely. <laughs> thank you. Well, we could thank the breakout room I was with, so I don't remember <laughs> what number they were, but thank you to that breakout room. So example three, and um, this is this is a real one, um, really interesting. Going to have students helping helping their uh, teachers and administrators make sure that they're getting their best possible uh, retirement returns on their 403b or 457b investments outside of TRS. How I mean, how cool is that, right? Um, so this is what was what was put out there. Um, and so with that said. We're going to look at the next question, which is what do you notice with the competencies and essential skills? And here's what we noticed. We noticed there were seven technical competencies and two essential skills. And so we did some hard work and decided the other decision. Let me just add the decisions we made. These are not the right or only decisions, really, depending on the direction that as teachers we're taking in this any of those seven could be pulled out based on the focus of this unit within an instructional course or this activity within the student's uh, career pathway learning experience. Um, there's not a single right answer, but ultimately we narrowed down the number of technical competencies covered to a more manageable number. Heather? Yeah, that's, a, that's exactly right. I think that uh, oftentimes when we take a look at how, how it's written, um, it can definitely check off those seven as, as they did in the, in the previous slide. However, when you really focus on that authentic problem and what it is the students are working on, you can get those narrowed down to the, to the what we, you know, sometimes I call that hyper-focused with that. Um, so what, there's multiple competencies that they're, they're hitting within this, but we really want it to be focused on say one or two for that area. And so, again, just another way of kind of breaking it down with some explanation here. Um, again, for most of the, the team-based challenges and the length of time that people are spending on most of the ones that, like, our team has interacted with, with people in the field, it's, it's okay to have literally one technical competency and one essential skill. And what's hard is, we know, and I wrote something about this in the chat earlier. Well, I know I'm covering all these things with students, so I feel like I want to assess them all, but really zero in and focus on what are the ones they need most, or if we've sequenced those out over the year, what are the ones we're focusing on right now, for example, or over the course of a semester. And so um, forcing yourself to kind of limit that can allow the students to have a deeper experience and you to be able to provide better feedback with it. And so wrapping up here, the arts and communications um, example for all the bad drivers. Um, I think I drove by some of these people on the way home from, from campus yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, one of them was driving a tanker. So that was fun. Um, anyway, so here the teachers decided the students are going to do a poster design um, to get people to be safer drivers. Um, and so the question is, first question is, what is the authentic problem? And the second question is about the student directions and roles. So here's what we noticed. It, we, going from the original problem statement to this, we asked ourselves, how could this be rewritten to really be around an authentic problem? And so, for example, we came up with in teams of three, students will design a communication solution to improve driver safety issues in their city as part of a citywide campaign. Maybe it's not a poster, right? Maybe they come up with a different solution to that. And so, um, and so that's a really great question Doug asked, is where does the rubric come from to create these career pathway technical competencies or to assess them and assess the performance levels? So as I mentioned, and we'll talk about this more in the workshops this summer, and yes, that was an ad. Um, the, that's a whole nother thing. It's the teachers who will determine what the appropriate performance level is. And that, that's hard work, so I know the districts that I've gotten to work with individually over the last few years, that is the thing we've spent the most time on, is defining that, creating an assessment tool. We've moved to oftentimes to rubrics that have like a single column. This is what proficient looks like, or two columns, proficient and developing, or a checklist. This is what I'm watching for to see if students can do these things. Um, so some really different looking, um, assessment tools have been created, but in all cases, teachers have sat around together 
and talked about what they would be looking for, even if only one teacher is actually teaching that class right now. Um, that's been a real common occurrence. It is 9.58. We are just about done. Um, I'm going to keep going. And if you need to drop off, obviously, please do that. Ben is going to drop the link in the chat for the evaluation. And we would ask if you can take a minute to take that evaluation. Those are really important to us. So great question there. Question two about this challenge is the teacher set up predetermined roles for each, each student. We, we kind of all reacted to that a little bit and said, well, wait, what's another alternative? Because this should be an integrated, the team should be integrated ultimately. And so how can that happen? And so, um, you know, here was, was like one layout and, and look at this, but ultimately we think the key on that, oops, is this notion of, what can what can integrate the team's work so that we're not pre-assigning one person needs to do this role, this role, and this role. And again, maybe super appropriate in sixth and seventh grade, but by the time we get into a team-based challenge in a course sequence, this is hopefully preparing them to move out to a further work-based learning experience where they're probably not going to be specifically assigned to those roles. Now, there could be certain exceptions in certain lines of work much like the question Terry posed earlier today about what if they're not working in a team? That's not common in this industry. And so those are things we, we can definitely talk more about in the future. Those are, are, I think, more unique questions, but good questions. Heather? Can you go back one slide, Jason? Yep, please. All right, so kind of continuing on with having those predetermined um, roles for the students, that also has each student working on separate skills. So the first student is doing the creation component, then there's the brand identity, and then that final student is the project management. So how do you make that consistent? If, if the, the goal of the team-based challenge is to focus on one or two skills, each student within that team or the team itself would be focused on those. And in this example, there, each student has its own skill set. So how would you do it? As we just talked about that rubric, the assessment, uh, the, the participation with the community partners, how are they able to identify what each role is, is doing? So think about it that way. There's going to be some, potentially some roles for each student, but in this case, it was identifying or it was actually each student had their own skill set that they were mastering for that. Yeah, yep, great, thank you. So a couple other little things to think about that did come up. And so this touches on some of those mentor things. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that the mentors can be involved. We think the most important is providing feedback, either on the assessment, this, this rectangular shape thing could be bigger. And also like during the exercise, I mean, really, really important that, that these outside experts are able to provide direct feedback to students. Um, we think students also hear that in a different way and get used to getting feedback from people like that. Um, some other considerations, ideas that have come up from different things people have done, um, hosting the kickoff or conclusion in, a, in another space than maybe students are normally in, could be at the business partner's location, could be somewhere in the community, um, and making sure if you're doing things like that, that that space is accessible to everybody. And also thinking about some of these team-based challenges, like with lots of our CTE stuff. And remember, these won't always take place in CTE classrooms. Um, making sure that all the necessary supplies are available. And so doing things like budgeting for that or, you know, early in the year, in the spring before, and saying what things might we need to buy for that. And of course, right now, as people are developing novel team-based challenges and getting used to this, that's going to be one of those things that in the short term over these next few years, people will be like, oh, we should have thought of this. We need to buy this. And so if you're in a leadership role, maybe keeping keeping some money aside, and, and many of you do this already for those, those last minute great ideas, uh, we expect to see a lot of those things um, be, be examples that are common within team-based challenges. Um, again, we'd remind everybody, focus your team-based challenge on the technical competencies and the essential skills alongside the authentic learning problem. Um, so this is, this is where you're drawing from those. You've got all the links to those in this presentation and, and focus on feedback with the community partners. So with that, um, last things. Don't be shy about sharing this out within your school, engaging other people to be supports in these processes. 
Um, and don't be shy about sharing these out within the communities. People love hearing about these things. School boards get excited about them. Other businesses get excited and say, wait, why did they get to do that? We want to do that. So share, 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 and please share these with all of us. Um, we can stay on if you've got some questions. We've got some final ads here and the evaluation. Um, and so um, I know there's a question in the chat from Heather. So we'll stick around. I wanted to wrap that up, um, but we will stick around and be happy to answer any other questions. And thank you so much. We hope you have a great weekend.